Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPD to advance excellent teaching. What does playing the flute have in common with working on an assembly line? Why would a baby be scared of a gentle rabbit? How does a dog learn to operate an elevator? Out of boy. Good. 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 Carefully, very slowly. Carefully. Learning, this time on Discovering Psychology. A cup of honey. Every animal, the name of the game is survival. The rules are simple. Find food and drink. Find shelter and avoid predators and hostile environments. Those who are best equipped to survive and who manage to mate will pass on their genes to the next generation. This is the true meaning of survival of the fittest. Fortunately, nature lends a helping hand. It provides animals with a set of built-in, inherited skills that function at birth or shortly thereafter. These skills are called reflexes. Some reflexes, like sucking, provide necessary biological supports. Other reflexes are ready-made, swift, and simple reactions to stimuli that pose a potential threat. And nature also provides more complex patterns of reaction, known as fixed action patterns. For example, the annual upstream journey of salmon to spawning grounds. These are sequences of actions triggered automatically by particular environmental and biological events and performed in the same way by every member of a species. These birds will migrate to the same destination at the same time of every year. When we take a look at animals that are more evolved, we find their behavior is less the replaying of the same old song and more a series of variations from individual to individual. The behavior of these animals is more adaptive to changing circumstances because of their capacity for learning. Learning is the way that a species profits from its experience. It's the mechanism by which past experience guides future behavior. This is true for humans as well as other animals. For humans, learning covers a wide range of activities, from acquiring a different language to studying in school. From playing sports to playing the flute. In the process of learning, an individual's behavior is modified. He or she acquires new habits and new ideas are put into practice. Can you mix up all these dry ingredients? Okay. Very carefully, slowly. very slowly and carefully, okay? Now while you're doing that, we need a cup The of new behavior can change the environment itself, making it more conducive to the individual's well-being. Learning allows us to do two important things in the quest for survival. First, to anticipate the future from past experience. And second, to control a complex and ever-changing environment. Traditionally, learning has been studied in laboratories like this one, using animals as subjects. In part, 
because it's easier to conduct controlled experiments with animals than it is with humans. And also because animals are like humans in important ways. As a result, behavioral psychologists have come up with new views, not only of animal behavior, but of human nature as well. And these views all concern a process that we take for granted, learning because we are all truly born to learn. Ironically, one of the most important figures in the study of learning, Ivan Pavlov, wasn't concerned with the subject at all, at least not at first. Pavlov, a noted Russian scientist, won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1904. As this original footage shows, Pavlov was initially interested in digestion and the action of the salivary glands. By diverting the saliva of dogs into test tubes, he could precisely measure if and how much they salivated during digestion. When food was presented, the dog salivated quickly, an inherited salivary reflex. But over repeated testings, a strange thing happened. The dog salivated before contact with the food. Just the sight of the food was enough to stimulate their drooling. Then, just seeing the food dish, or even hearing the footsteps of Pavlov or his assistants, was enough to trigger this built-in reflex. What was going on to elicit this response? Pavlov decided to find out by systematically varying the stimuli and measuring the dog's reaction. Metronomes, lights, and bells were all used as stimuli, and they all worked as stand-ins for the food. What mattered was not the kind of stimulus that was used, but the fact that it reliably signaled that food was on the way. Pavlov had discovered a fundamental type of learning called classical conditioning. An original stimulus elicits an automatic unlearned response. Both stimulus and response happen naturally. They are unconditioned. Then a second, neutral stimulus that never elicits the unconditioned response by itself is introduced just before the presentation of the original stimulus. If the neutral or signaling stimulus is presented alone and a response occurs as if the original stimulus were still there, we say that conditioning has taken place. The arbitrary neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. The reverse is also true. Pavlov and others studied the extinction over time of such conditioned responses. When the subject learns that the conditioned stimulus no longer signals a desired event, the acquisition process is reversed as the learned connection is gradually weakened. Pavlov's work, and the work of those who followed him, led to a remarkable conclusion. And that is, any stimulus an organism can perceive is capable of eliciting any reaction the organism is capable of making. This means that virtually any sound, sight, or smell can influence the way our muscles tense or relax, our moods fluctuate, or even the way our attitudes are formed. For instance, if I say, relax, and then do this, you're going to be startled and upset. After five or six pairings of relax, just saying the word relax is going to generate a negative response rather than its usual learned reaction. Classical conditioning can be so powerful, in fact, that it can actually make us sick by suppressing the body's immune system. The immune system is a complex network of specialized organs and cells that protect the body from disease. It releases antibodies to destroy or contain dangerous bacteria, viruses, and other invaders. When the immune system is conditioned not to work, the results can be devastating. At the University of Rochester Medical School, researcher Robert Ada and his colleague Nicholas Cohn condition rats to dislike something they usually like very much, the taste of saccharin-flavored water. Ader discovered he had also unintentionally conditioned the rat's immune system to shut down. 
we were pairing a saccharin flavored drinking solution with an agent that produced a temporary stomach ache in rats uh, using a drug called cyclophosphamide. And indeed, we found, as we expected, that uh, the more of the saccharin they consumed, the stronger was the aversion to the taste of saccharin uh, when it was paired with this drug that made them sick. Over a month's time, giving these animals repeated exposures to saccharin instead of their usual water, some of the animals died. Now, this was an experiment in which animals should not have died. There was no reason for them to have died. And when this happens in an experiment, when it's not supposed to, this is troublesome. You, you look for a reason why. It turns out that the drug we were using to induce this taste aversion is a powerful immunosuppressive drug. It suppresses immune responses. At the same time that we were conditioning the behavioral response, which was avoidance of the saccharin, we were also conditioning the effects of the drug that is an immunosuppressive response. Every time the animal was exposed to saccharin, there was an aversion response and there was also a suppression of the immune system. So even the immune system may be influenced by conditioning. We can learn to become sick and possibly die. Classical conditioning is not the only kind of conditioning. While Pavlov had shown the importance of learning relationships between two stimulus events, an American psychologist named Edward Thorndike pioneered the study of another kind of learning around the turn of the century. Thorndike was interested in how individuals learn solutions to the complex puzzles the world devises. How do we and other animals learn the habits and new skills that enable us to find our way through life's mazes? By carefully observing, measuring, and quantifying the performance of experimental animals, Thorndike discovered the type of learning we call instrumental conditioning. Thorndike's animals work by trial and error. The actions that brought reward, that is, the actions that were instrumental to achieving a goal, became learned. To Thorndike, it's the consequences of what an individual does that most influence the learning process. Thorndike's Law of Effect states that learning is controlled by its consequences. Those behaviors followed by good consequences are selected and repeated, while those leading to bad consequences, or no consequences at all, are not repeated. Another American psychologist who was greatly influenced by Pavlov was John B. Watson. Watson believed that learned, observable behavior was the only thing in psychology worthy of scientific study. He attacked the doctrines of inherited traits and instincts as the cause of behavior. Instead, he spoke of the unlimited power of conditioning and environmental control to mold a behavior.